Good morning. Welcome to the last day of the ninth Project and Community Workshop. Who's happy it's Friday? I'm certainly happy it's Friday. Okay, we got some feedback last year on how to do this part of the meeting. This is where everybody who had a breakout session gets to come up here and talk to their one slide for one minute. So what we're going to try to do is everyone who, is, who had a session on Monday to come up here and then just step in when you see your name on the slide to do your one minute. And we'll do that day by day. So let's get started. Everyone who is talking to a session on Monday. Great, Brian, because you're first. Everybody who is presenting for Monday, please come up now. There's at least more than two people due up here. Oh, yeah, and by the way, applause will be at the end, so no applause until Friday, please. Okay, for uh, the ComCam breakout, we basically just uh, went over the uh, schedule of progress from the, uh, the past year um, and then finished, the, finished with the upcoming hardware integration uh, and uh, presented some opportunities for detailed characterization of the, um, the integrated system. Uh, with the focus on uh, establishing the software control yeah, right before the, um, the shipping to Chile. So that's, that's all I have. Hi. Um, this year, the organizing committee really wanted to give the science collaborations a chance to address um, the participants of the PCW. So that meant that we didn't have the subsystem 101s in the plenaries this year. So instead, we had um, to get all our new people up to speed. We had a welcome to LSST, a basic introduction session on Monday at 1.30. We had about 50 people new to either LSST or the PCW come together in that room. They did an icebreaker so they could meet at least someone else here at the meeting. And then we discussed various aspects of the PCW so they could figure out how to navigate this rather complicated meeting. And then we learned about core concepts and terminology from each of the LSST uh, subsystem representatives that were there. And I want to thank them very much. Their names are all listed. I want to thank them for preparing slides and coming and talking to the new people. If they I? May I? Okay. So we had a DM All Hands meeting uh, on Monday. We did not have a big team meeting this year, I think like some of the other subsystems, so we really wanted to get together for at least an hour and a half here. Um, just going through everything that DM's done during the year, uh, major accomplishments, welcoming all the new people that have joined, a few people <clears throat> leaving us. There's a picture with Xu Jin at the bottom here, uh, who is moving on to other projects. Um, so quite a bit of movement actually in, in DM. Uh, there was also a very good demonstration of cloud computing with AWS running our pipeline code uh, given by uh, Xin Fang, who's probably still around the place somewhere. That was uh, very well received. And we had the discussion of the Gen 3 middleware. If you're not programming, you don't care about that, but we care a lot about that. And so that was a, a topic, in fact, all week, which was the DM hack sessions, getting everybody ported to Gen 3 butler and middleware. <coughs> And that's it from DM. Good morning. Uh, a very active year for shipping and logistics this year. Around about a thousand tons of critical items cargo delivered to the summit this year, over three major project cargo shipments. This slide shows the successful delivery of M1, M3. Uh, <clears throat> uh, another successful delivery. We've had our share of events, but no major losses, or even any losses at all. And uh, I'd like to thank, uh, it, this slide doesn't show 
the level of participation in the program with our vendors, with our contractors, and especially our partners at Aura to facil facilitate all of these deliveries in, ex in a very successful logistics program. So thank you very much to all. Oh, and Jack, and Jack has his stands and his tie downs. If Tuesday people could start making your way up, that would be great. Okay, um, so on Monday we had a good uh, collaborating session for the, to talk about the uh, computerized maintenance management system, which, um, as we know, uh, we won't get any data if the motors aren't running and lubricated, that have the chains lubricated and all the fans working. Um, so to do that, we need hundreds of procedures to be used by people at certain amounts of time when time's available on the observatory. And so our, the system we're trying to put together, the tools, it's really a, describing processes and using tools we, we have in place in many cases. But we want to um, uh, take care of the planned maintenance, the unplanned maintenance. We want to integrate with our inventory management to be able to get parts, uh, to our document management system to get uh, procedures. And then eventually, hopefully, we'll be able to um, do predictive maintenance and monitor trends and know when we can adjust our maintenance schedules or we have to perform maintenance before something breaks. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me or, or input. It's a good collaborative in effort across the uh, observatories to see how other people are having challenges and successes. And so um, if you have s maintenance challenges or successes, let me know about it. Thanks. Solar system. Hi, okay, so uh, I was uh, given the task of doing the solar system uh, science uh, overview because I wasn't at the actual session and they thought it would be interesting to see if I could understand their slides. Uh, so uh, I think the major thing that's going on in the solar system community is trying to understand what year one's gonna look like in terms of the, uh, 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 whether difference, Im like difference imaging won't be available, but how will they be doing detection of some of the fast moving asteroids because they'll only be basically in that first, year, you know, each year will be a fresh set of objects, so uh, how's that going to work? And also um, looking at new uh, algorithms for doing detection of uh, faint TNOs where you have to do image stacking and shifting, which is also something outside of the regular pipeline. Um, there's also some concern, uh, I think it's a general concern for the LSST community about uh, the LEO satellites and uh, how prolific they may be becoming and how that might be interfering with transient detections. And we really need to do some simulations to understand the real impact and try to engage in sort of dialogue with that community of satellite uh, propagators. Uh, and then there's uh, a solar system notification alert processing system, SNAPS, uh, community alert broker that was discussed. Um, and that was presented also at the community alert, uh, the broker's workshop a few months ago in Seattle. Uh, and I think that's actually gonna turn out to be a very important part of the solar system uh, community's uh, collaborative efforts on LSST. Hi. We had a breakout session on new features in uh, Scarlet. So Scarlet is our uh, deblender that we're developing at the moment. You have on the top right corner an example of how Scarlet performs compared to the HSC deblender on a nasty blend. These new features include uh, learning the prior for the morphology of galaxies. That's work conducted with Francois Lanus on pixel CNNs. Peter is working on adaptive proximal gradients, which is a way of saving us the big trouble of trying to estimate a gradient slope that we can't compute analytically. And I'm working on combining um, images at different resolutions. So you have HST and HSC images in the top right corner. And in the middle is the scarlet reconstruction when we try to fit them both at the same time. So we get high resolution and color images. So these are the main new features uh, in scarlet. Thank you. Data rights? Data rights in Priya? Is that Bob Lomo? Bob? Uh, you guys want to read it real quick and then we'll move on? Uh, I, 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 Can you say something? Sure. Okay. Uh, so at the at the the data rights and pre-ops uh, session, 
uh, where there were two, two big topics. One was, uh, was the data rights, and there was a lot of opportunity for, for Q&A. Uh, the other main topic was uh, the pre-operations, and in particular talking about the, uh, the data previews. So the data previews are really designed uh, for the operations team to get practice going through the entire process of creating a data release, including the documentation and support. And so Bob and Phil talked about three a scenario with three different data previews, uh, the first one being based on simulated or precursor data, one being based on ComCam, and one being based on LSST CAM. Um, so uh, I, I, I look forward to, you know, to, to continued interactions with the community on, on what these will look like. In the last year, our EPO department has been actively involved with designing investigations for the classroom. And what we did at our session is we talked, first of all, a little bit about uh, the suite of investigations we're planning on developing, uh, talked a little bit about our audiences, and uh, then had a discussion for a little while about how scientists could help us uh, with contributions of data or ideas for us in terms of solving some of the complex problems we have with uh, making proxy data work in our investigations. So right now, all of our user testing is going to happen by using non-LSST data. And once we get that first round of user testing done, then we'll go back and, and make tweaks to our investigations. So it's really important that uh, different people in the science community step up to help us. If you've got great uh, code for us or if you've got data for us, please check out our slides that are posted and you can see our specific asks. And then finally what we did is we spent uh, the, the greater part of our program exploring some of the prototypes we've built with web applications. Uh, really because of the timing, we spent most of our time uh, looking at one specific web application that we've just recently worked on. And then we had a little discussion about that. Finally, we took the last 10 minutes of our session to show a prototype assessment video that we've designed and to get people's feedback on that. As you know, in Chile, there's so much going on, and the networks are not the exception. Last Tuesday, we went over the accomplishments from fiscal year 19, including our beautiful data center you can see there. And we also went over the new challenges we'll face in fiscal year 20, plus currently checking the current status of the working networks. And as we move forward, you know that we will have to build and operate networks at the same time, so, which is difficult. So the message is the same as always, get your requirements in so we can get them on a shell. Feel free to send me an email if you have any questions. Thank you. Okay, more things I wasn't there for. Uh, <laughs> so uh, actually this is really good news that with the uh, moving towards a different uh, detection pipeline or an evolved detection pipeline for the solar system community, uh, moving away from the PanStars MOP system uh, was discussed. Uh, again, there's this uh, question about what to do in the first year without good difference imaging, uh, and also about how quickly the North Ecliptic Spur components difference imaging and basically the ecliptic in general, how will that build up fast enough to be of use for the community. Um, there was also some discussion about uh, cadences, and so uh, there was an exploration, uh, Lynn Jones did an exploration of um, what the rolling cadence would look like for uh, the solar system community and found that it actually wasn't as, as disastrous as some had anticipated it would be. It does have negative impacts though, and so some continued interactions on designing cadences that can meet multiple science goals is needed. In this session, we reviewed the great progress that's made in the last year in standing up an alert um, uh, follow-up network, um, which is diagrammed on the right side of the slide there. There are already several brokers, including NOAO's Antares, which is now processing, classifying, and filtering ZTF public alerts. And 15 teams submitted letters of intent to LSST to uh, build the LST community brokers. The next stage is called the Target Observation Managers, or TOMS, 
which is a science uh, layer which prioritizes the alerts and links those with um, observation um, with observatories. And Las Cumbres Observatory is leading an effort to build a TOM toolkit, which is a library to make these easy to make. And we are organizing a workshop later this year um, to help uh, promote the development of the TOMs, and it's also an observing opportunity on LCO, Gemini, and SOAR. And finally, a group called EON, or the Astronomical Event Observatory Network, Las Cumbres, NOEO, SOAR, and Gemini, are building up a process of automatically scheduling observations on the telescopes and returning data. SOAR is now has a queue option using the LCOGT scheduler. It's in operation, and Gemini is in the process of developing new APIs and schedulers. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Ellen Bechtel uh, chaired and coordinated this meeting on equity and inclusion in astronomy, uh, along with help from um, Lauren Corlees, uh, Keith Bechtel, and I. Uh, we heard from 11 different uh, diversity and equity inclusion activities within uh, the whole community, and we had uh, lightning talks from Andres Plazas and Keith Bechtel, Rampal Gill, Sandrine Thomas, Blake Mason, Lauren Corlees, and Bob Blum. We had a small group activity that explored challenges uh, that we all faced, and we crowdsourced solutions. So please check out uh, the slides from the session that includes resources from the different uh, science collaborations and communities uh, within LSST. Please join our inclusion channel in um, Slack, and there you will find the output from our activity compiled into a Google Talk so we can continue our conversation. Thank you. We had a lively session on how to make friends and get your work done. Uh, and really, what does that mean? It means if you have something, a complex idea or anything, to communicate to someone, uh, whether it be through an email, through a talk, through a paper, through anything, you really need to sit down and the first step is to identify what that thing is. What do you want people to take away from this format? Once you have that identified, uh, then you need to think about what your audience is. How are you presenting it? How, like, if it's an email, Give them the like, point, what's the action, when's the due date at the top, and then go into all the reasonings behind you want, why you want them to do that. If it's a presentation, before you start doing anything, think about what you want people to take away from that presentation, and then you start building up the argument for that. Uh, less is more, especially in presentations. Don't give people like 20 things to take away. Uh, tell a story. Uh, use analogies as a good tool for how you tell a story. Many of you might remember the excellent Corgi analogy from last year. Uh, it was very powerful and memory memorable, and now you kind of have an idea of how big the camera is because of how many Corgis fit inside it. <laughs> um, choose visuals and graphics to amplify that story over words. Uh, if you can think of a way to visualize it, it makes much more of an impact. Corgis, corgis. Um, and practice, 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 and stick to time. That's a way to respect your audience. Uh, and just a small plug, LSST is hiring. Yay, there's the links. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Andres Plazas. I'm, uh, I work at DM in Princeton. I'm presenting on behalf of Aaron Rodman and uh, Steve Britz from Slack. So we organized a um, joint session between the data management and camera subsystems on focal plane signatures and removals. Uh, we heard uh, from, um, for example, from Adam Snyder uh, from Slack uh, about correction from charge tra transfer efficiency, inefficiency using um, X-rays uh, hits. Uh, that's the plot that you see in the lower part in the center. Uh, we also heard from Yusuke Utsumi from Slack about the structures in quantum um, structures of quantum efficiency in flat fields. Sometimes uh, there are quantum efficiency st um, structures, but sometimes they're actually structures due to um, pixel area variation. So this is very important to, to figure out the difference between these two. Uh, we also heard from Eric Charles from uh, uh, Slack uh, regarding an analysis of spots uh, in flat fields. Uh, very, and Eric also wrote a very nice uh, set of tools that's going to help us analyze uh, our images from data management and, 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 um, and the data taken at Slack. Um, we also heard from Andrew Bracher regarding um, astrometry and simulations, which is uh, with their group that they have at Davis. Uh, this is the image that you see on the lower part on, on the right, where it, you can actually solve Poisson's equations and put the adequate boundary conditions, and then um, you can learn about the astrometry effects that we need to, to take care of. 
So Aaron told us about gain and uh, thermal stability, and then I talked from the DM point of view about the steps that we take uh, to do instrument signature removal and the type of algorithms that uh, we're implementing and how the community can also give us input uh, uh, for that. So um, in the end, um, in summary, we have made a lot of progress during this year, but there's still a lot of work uh, to do. And uh, what we want to do is to increment the communication between the two subsystems. And uh, I started thinking about um, data monitoring algorithms for uh, different effects. So um, we're uh, explicitly thinking about more communication paths as new defects are, are uncovered and, and addressed. We do have uh, telecoms between the um, um, the um, camera testing and verification working groups and the sensor anomalies working group for the dark energy science collaboration. And uh, I wanted to take the opportunity to encourage those people who belong to other science collaborations. And if you want to tell us about your favorite uh, instrument signature thing that is going to affect your science, please talk to us. And um, we would love to hear from you as well. Thank you. You got it? Okay. Thanks. Good. So, so some people may know that the original name for LSST was the Dark Matter Telescope. Um, the science of dark matter is a really big topic, and the actual techniques for studying dark matter are distributed across many of the different science collaborations. So what's happened over the last couple of years is there's been this grassroots uh, community effort to produce uh, two different white papers uh, and also organize several workshops to really build and describe the science case around uh, dark matter. So I think I think this did uh, quite a good job of, of exploring uh, the complementarities with other uh, search methods. Um, and I think I'm really happy with actually the way that this has brought together observers and theorists in, in a combined probes approach. Uh, so a recent development is that there's now a dark matter working group that's established within the dark energy science collaboration. So this gives us a central hub uh, where we can congregate. Uh, but we are very much looking forward to form uh, collaborative arrangements with other science collaborations around specific techniques and follow-up efforts in theory. Um, so if you're interested in this effort, uh, you can go to this GitHub page or click on any of the links on this slide and find out more. Thanks. In our session, we asked the Templeton Foundation for several million dollars to support LSST science. But first, I gave a brief overview about what the corporation is and what we do, and went over some of our activities, and perhaps most importantly, introduced a very ambitious $75 million program that we're currently fundraising for. The name of this program is LINK, and it would involve a whole suite of programs to support the scientific community. Those would include things like grants programs, funds for workshops, and seed funding. I also briefly talked about the benefits of being a member in LSST Corporation. But most of our session was involved in splitting up into small teams and having a sprint where people brainstormed ideas that they could pitch to the Templeton Foundation. And I'm happy to say I think six letters of inquiry will go in, four or five have already gone in as the result of our session on topics ranging from equity and inclusion in STEM to SETI to uh, data science incubator and various other science topics. Thanks. If speakers for Wednesday sessions could please come up, that includes those who might be speaking about their own conference. I have to say we are thankful to the LSSTC for funding our first year of this program and uh, we have testimonials my students will be giving you um, in the next couple of weeks. Thank you very much. My name is Connie Walker and I am from NOAO uh, and I've been uh, really pleased at listening at a lot of these talks by you scientists and engineers because you exuded this passion for what you do. And NOIO has a program in which you can actually participate and, and share that enthusiasm with high school students who you, we are trying to influence to go into STEM fields and maybe even work for you someday. Okay, so this is a free out of school program that happens once a month on the first Saturday of the month here in Tucson. What we're really trying to do is now um, 
disseminate this program to whomever is interested in, in sharing the, the, well, the wisdom and the experience, the lessons learned that we have uh, experienced. And we have uh, a guide and everything that you might want to know about building such a program. And uh, we have actually activities. And what the, the presenter, the scientist usually does is give a half hour presentation followed by another 45 minutes of a activity that on their research with their research tools that the high school has experienced. And it's very enriching. So we had um, uh, the uh, youth leaders, the teen, the uh, high school students actually come and uh, show people in the audience these uh, various Jupyter notebooks that we have um, uh, created uh, through the help of the astronomers. And uh, so that both the notebooks that we have, uh, some of them online, that uh, you can get to from the webpage that the um, Teen Cafe is on at the LSST um, conference website, as well as the guide. And I hope that if you are interested, please come see me or email me. My name again is Connie Walker, and I thank you very much. Hello. So I was actually not in this session because I was attending the Alex Tell session, but uh, Lynn and Peter uh, had to go back to Seattle, so I'm, they asked me to present their sessions. So in this session, the, observ the observing strategy, they're showing the current uh, progress on the scheduler. Uh, pretty much uh, most of the work that we've been doing the last couple of, uh, well, the last couple of months was uh, responses to the, white, to the call to the white paper, white papers. Uh, we have pretty much redesigned the entire scheduler. It's now a much more flexible uh, framework for us to respond to the community. And we have done several new simulations, uh, over 80, that we've been sending them to the community to work on their science and see if the scheduler and the strategy that come out from the new scheduler uh, actually accomplish what the science that you guys want to do. And that's it. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. Hi, I'm Suzanne Jacoby. I'm going to tell you about this informal working session we had on joint communications organized by Gail Schifrin, Rampal Gill, communications leads for IN2P3, LSST, respectively. We took a look at conferences, meetings, a couple that have happened, a few that are coming up, including uh, looking for ways we can collaborate, work together. There's going to be a town hall at this uh, AAS DPS meeting that's taking place in September in Geneva, I believe. There's an opportunity, SPIE, June 2020, if anyone can dare look that far ahead. And then also supercomputing, where many of our institutional members with strong technical contributions already participate. What can we do there? Looking at milestones, a, a very big one, of course, is the filter exchange system, which is going to be traveling from Paris to Slack and arriving in the first week of October. Gael is already making plans for a social media campaign and a documentary, which is in production. We'll have English subtitles. We'll be watching for that, re-promoting that. Um, other projects, ongoing coordination through social media. Dark Matter Day occurs annually on Halloween, and you all know that Day in the Life this year, 10-4, October 4th, yay, and we'll be collaborating there. Um, Gail made a specific point that the LSST group in France is very interested in development, development of the education tools that's going on here, and they can help. So there's a, a shout out to that group and more collaboration. And then the little graphic here, many of you are aware of this really cool comic book that was developed through um, uh, Gail's efforts in France. Um, a new version is completed. It's inclusive. It doesn't have any copyright issues with Darth Vader. Um, and it will soon be available for distribution and ideas for translating it into English and Spanish are developing and also there's interest in doing something not just about the camera which this is limited to but the entire project so this is a really cool fun thing to do that's it oh, you did. Uh, morning all I'm John Swinbank and I'm going to tell you about the DMQA session we had on Wednesday morning 
So the idea here is that members of DM spend a lot of their time looking at the pixels that are going into our science algorithms, looking at the numbers that are coming out of our science algorithms, trying to figure out whether they're doing the right thing, and if not, how to fix them. So about a year ago, we set up a working group to kind of cut across DM and make sure that we were approaching this in a unified and coherent way and not duplicating effort. So we took the opportunity this, this week to get together, discuss the progress that has been made on acting on the recommendations from that group. So we, we discussed image visualization tools. We talked about how to keep track of high level, what we call metrics, which are kind of summary statistics describing how the processing is going. And we talked then about how to go from those high level metrics to developing new tools to drill down into the data and understand what's going wrong or what's going right and help us figure out how to fix it. So I think it was a really productive session and there's a lot of cool new tooling coming soon. Okay, the focus of our session on Wednesday was uh, to bring together uh, DM experts and uh, consumers for the photometric uh, redshift table that's going to be in the object uh, catalog. Um, we reviewed some use cases with the users. Uh, some things that came out of that was that's not in the current scope is the need for physical parameter estimates, uh, quality flags both for scientific and EPO purposes, and access for the brokers to uh, photometric data promptly. Um, we discussed that DM will need external partners to generate photo Zs. Uh, we discussed whether what the timing of that will be, whether they, the photo Zs will come out concurrent with the, the data or whether there will be a slight offset in the time. Um, we discussed various options where we could use compression to maybe store multiple estimates if different groups have different optimal photometric redshift needs. Again, there will be a dependence on the computational load as to whether or not we can do that. Um, we discussed workflows and how commissioning data will play a role in early photometric redshift calibration and, and storage. Uh, and we started to brainstorm a list of potential validation criteria. You can see those if you're interested on the session slides linked on the slides here. Uh, and a final note, this will be the, the in input from this session will be used to update the DM technical note 049. So if you care about photometric redshifts, you can look there at the project level. Hello, I'm Andy Clements. I'm the manager for Telescope Insight Software. Um, there's been a lot of changes on Telescope Insight Software um, in terms of architecture, team, and so forth, and there's a lot of challenges going ahead. So the main reason I wanted to put this session together is kind of start a conversation or a communication channel into what we're looking at, what we need to do, and how we need to work with the rest of the project uh, to move this telescope forward. Um, as we're going through the list here, like the architecture changes, we have changed from a more monolithic system to a more um, ad hoc system, they start learning about the characterization of the telescope, how it's going to work, so we can start using those learning things to add them back into the software. Um, there have been a lot of personnel changes, like me becoming the manager, our software architect has changed. Um, also, if you know LabVIEW and you're looking for a job, I'm hiring. Um, there have been some policy changes, we're starting to move things around, trying to be a little more proactive in our approach to what this project needs, make sure we are there when you need us with the code that needs to work. We all know integration is coming, if you haven't figured that out from this entire uh, thing, we, uh, we, that's all we're going to be doing for the next year and a half. Um, we're trying to do integration through communication, making sure that we talk to the right people like DM and IT and the rest of the other subsystems to work together to move this forward. We have changed our testing and deployment. We've now worked it into our entire system to make sure our code is better and it's out there on time. Um, and then I kind of went over the entire whole scope of all the projects, with all the components we're working on there. Um, you can kind of see it in the little diagram down there below. Um, so as part of the Oxtel uh, session, we talked about the first light engineering run and some of the challenges we faced and what we're doing to address those. Uh, we also uh, talked about the need for Oxtel to be a pathfinder and really exercise the end-to-end the -end functionality of the LSST system from 
pointing a telescope at a star all the way to data products popping out the other end of the DM system and what we have to do to get that going. Um, one of the important things that is coming up in integration, of course, is the, the, the need to prioritize certain activities that have to get done normally on uh, specifically regarding cross subsystem aspects for software and how do we get that mechanism up and going. And we're also we talked a lot about what it's going to take to get the spectrograph out the door and hopefully have it on sky by the end of the year. Yeah, so that's the session that I was attending instead of the scheduler one. So this one I attended. Uh, so now that we had all that work that we do with the scheduler, we have all those new simulations. We have to do something about them. And the first thing you do is calculate metri metrics and compare them. So this session was uh, discussing some of the changes that happens on the results of the simulation once we change some uh, parameters on the simulation. And yeah, pretty much showing uh, how we can evaluate them, the main changes that we see from the, the main science goals and asking uh, the community to give us input on the simulations and the metrics, especially new metrics that uh, show how good a, a survey strategy or how bad it is for your science. So if you have any ideas, if you have some metrics, if you have a science case that needs to be uh, check it, contact us, uh, myself, Dean, and Peter, and let's work, work together. Give us some metrics, give us some input, so we can make this happen for everybody. So good morning. Um, I'm reporting for Dave, David Thomas today. He uh, organized a very interesting uh, session on wavefront sensing uh, around LSST, and we had four very exciting talks from David Thomas, Josh Meyer, Yon Yin, and Aaron Rudman. The first one was really describing what we're actually doing at LSST right now, the baseline of how we do uh, wavefront sensing, looking at curvature sensing um, mostly, but also looking at maybe uh, forward modeling and machine learning. Then uh, Josh Meyer uh, showed us his uh, forward donor model that he's doing for HSE, and that was really, uh, really interesting. Uh, he's also presented his package that is called Batoid, and maybe some of you are using or heard of FOSIM, and it's a, it's a tool that is very similar to that, um, or running maybe a little faster. Then we had machine learning, so something very new to me. <laughs> I don't know a lot about machine learning, so that's, um, that was very promising too. Lots of learning curve there, but uh, very promising technique. And then finally, we heard about the DECAM uh, lessons that Aaron Woodman had over the, the last few years. Uh, DECAM is using a similar uh, wavefront sensing method as LSST, so that's why it's, it's very uh, useful to hear from, from, that, uh, from that instrument. And that's it. Okay, uh, so I, I am uh, presenting on behalf of Alex Derlica Wagner. Uh, we had another uh, of the sessions of the, of the Stack Club face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, we're particularly interested in, in attracting new members to the Stack Club, so I think we had a good, good turnout, but, but we're, we're looking to grow. Um, the objective of the Stack Club is really to introduce um, and, and, and try to uh, help community members uh, gain familiarity with the Stack, and so we're really aimed on education and creating tutorials that will be useful uh, for many different science cases. Uh, there were four walkthroughs of, of new Stack Club notebooks. Um, they were all, all excellent. And uh, I think Alex put in this, this picture. Uh, the, the, the lesson of this is don't forget your, your multi-factor authentication at NCSA. Okay. This was a session on applying um, machine learning to blending challenges. And I'd like to cast your eyes down to the very bottom of the slide. 
Uh, we heard the perspective from LSST DM, which was important and interesting to hear. Uh, so DM is not expecting any machine learning approaches to deep learning to be mature enough to be included in the DM pipelines for DR1, and I don't think anyone was surprised by that. However, machine learning may have a big role to play in deblending later in LSST operations, just because the blending challenge uh, is so great. Uh, and so we need to keep monitoring it. So the way we structured this was, there was with this matrix where um, on the left, you see the vertical axis is the different types of challenges. So detecting overlapping objects, deblending overlapping pot, uh, objects, and then making measurements on them. And we structured these uh, eight or nine contributions uh, that we heard about a few minutes each on projects that people are pursuing, applying these different machine learning algorithms to uh, these different types of problems, sorted according to the computer vision uh, type um, classification of supervised versus unsupervised um, machine learning. And importantly, um, Jim, all, Jim Bosch was the LSST DM representative in the very bottom bu bullet. He talked about what makes an algorithm pipeline rate ready, so uh, battle hardened um, to be implemented in the pipeline. And for that, um, the bottom row of the matrix is very important, uh, infrastructure. So uh, we need to have something for training, testing, and comparing different detection, deblending, and or measurement algorithms with a consistent set of images and performance metrics. And we heard about the blending toolkit, which um, a graduate student, Somia Kamath, is um, pursuing, and we need more people to help with that. And everything in the session is in one set of Google Slides linked to this slide. So I think we had a really great session trying to discuss how do we bring something like the alert stream with all of its data to the public. It's really one of the huge strengths of the telescope is really imaging the transient sky and how do we leverage that and the things that we're building. Um, so I think we had a really great session brainstorming all the fun things that you can do. And for me, a, thing, a theme that came out is a discussion around the idea of different timescales of discovery and how that can relate to depth of communication and what we're trying to get across. So this idea of what kinds of things should we really be updated maybe on a nightly time scale versus a weekly one versus a monthly one where it could maybe you can go into more detail and bring in some data and some exploration that way. Um, and ultimately a lot of this work depends on the relationship that we develop between the alert stream and the broker since they're providing additional information that we'll need to serve to the public and we're looking forward to continuing to do that. And if you have any ideas related to this, feel free to reach out to EPO, we're brainstorming everything. Thanks. Hi, I'm here just as a straw man because the unconference is a self-organized session, so I didn't organize anything. Uh, we ask you to um, submit um, proposals for sessions that will be self-organized and self-managed um, about things that were missing in the program as we organized it, and there was a great turnout. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine sessions, of which actually two don't really count as um, as unconference sessions, but they're not in the list, right? The invitation only ones. Yeah, there's 11 topics. 11 topics, including the two by invitation. Yes. There were two conference, unconference proposals that were by invitation. That doesn't really count as an unconference, but it was our failure to communicate that to you. All the other topics were open, and um, people will present about those topics next. I can talk about the, I was at the math sprint, so I can briefly talk about it. There was a math sprint to write some metrics. Um, it, there were about four or five people in it, and they wrote metrics about um, galactic bulge stellar population, um, also missing from this slide, but we talked about metrics about TDs and aliasing. Um, some of the metrics were uploaded to notebooks, others are still in the working. And this session had both uh, Lean and Peter uh, sitting on it and helping us write metrics. Russell Owen had to catch a plane, so I agreed to take this over for him. Uh, the Watcher, as you do or do not know, has been coming along quite swimmingly. Um, we're about done on the coding end of it, um, which means we start writing the rules for it. Um, so we kind of got together and started brainstorming some places where we'd know some rules would come from, and we got a few uh, listed categories here. And I think the idea here is for us to write a bunch of rules together in a closed room without hawking anybody and then releasing them and see how many people we make angry and they'll start talking back to us about what's needed. Um, 
We're hoping to get your feedback from these things, hoping to get, generate some ideas, because I think a lot of you know better what the rules should be than I should. Um, so I hope to be talking to you soon. Hi, so I'm Adam Thornton. I went to the documentation of this big science project uh, breakout. Um, it was a little bit lightly attended, and I would like to counsel everyone that if in future you are going to want to push back about the stories being told about you during this project, you, you may want to start contesting that narrative now. Um, so there have been a great many decisions made in the, in the course of the project. Uh, we have a lot of technical documentation. It's in a bunch of places. We do not have a good index for it, and as a former historian, I will let you know that the quality of the source is often less important than how quickly one can find it and understand what it means. Um, we are also very light on the personal narratives behind those technical decisions or informing those technical decisions. Uh, there were a couple of uh, suggestions, which I'll get to, but um, you know, documenting hardware is pretty easy. You've got the engineering drawings, you've got uh, the pictures of what it looked like when. It's a lot, di it's a lot more difficult both for pers personal narratives and for software. Um, if your stuff has some sort of an interface and you're a developer, take a snapshot, of, take a screenshot, take a screencast every couple of years. Save that. Someone will be interested someday. Um, we determined we didn't know whether INCOA has an archivist or library, and we really ought to know that, and we really ought to know what the plan for transitioning our retained documents to them are. Um, and uh, we felt that one of the primary things to do is that... Uh, if you're willing to keep a personal diary, do, and then every five years or so, um, circle back, have a project rep retrospective. People tend to get a lot chattier in retirement about uh, what happened in the project. And you know, a lot of the things that we find infuriating now are, are just going to seem amusing in 20 years. Plus, uh, retrospective parties are always fun. Thank you. So we had uh, a few questions after uh, my very brief talk at the um, plenary on Tuesday. One of them was, okay, so um, the Starlink satellites, as they are currently at station in orbit, aren't painted black, and um, they appear quite bright, uh, and they actually exceed the, uh, the uh, well depth of the CCD, and so the CCD saturates. Um, and if you want to get away from that problem, you either um, observe into the night side of away from the sun or you try to avoid them. And so one of the answers to that question is, okay, so suppose you actually um, point into the sunset or the sunrise. And there are some science programs that actually want to do this. Uh, the one that has caught the attention of Congress is Earth-Threatening Asteroids. But there are several others. And so um, Andrew Bradshaw went into the lab and we illuminated uh, one of the LSST CCDs with exactly the brightness of the Leo, of, of the Starlink trail that Todd Borison at LCOGT calibrated in his observations, transferred onto the LST, LSST system. So what you do is you go to an eight meter telescope instead of a 40 centimeter telescope, and you go um, uh, uh, to better seeing by a little bit. And that's what it looks like. Uh, it blooms all the way up and down the CCD. So what you tend to lose in this, uh, so I have to say that we designed the camera in a way to minimize these effects. So the camera is composed of uh, many CCDs, and each CCD is segmented into 16 pieces, and so um, uh, this doesn't damage the entire focal plane, but somewhere around 4% or so, or larger, um, is the number. So you just sort of like to get rid of this, and so we're in communication with uh, a Starlink uh, folks at, at SpaceX, and they really do want to help, and um, so going forward, uh, the question is, what are they going to do? Um, I don't know. Maybe eventually they're going to paint them black. Uh, but um, we have some simulations to do, and we're going to go in the lab and simulate full observing campaigns uh, with uh, a, a variety of different um, uh, distributions of this. Um, so stay tuned.
So I wanted to start by thanking the organizers for having an unconference session as somebody perpetually disorganized or at least busy. Um, it never occurs to me to suggest a session for this conference until I get here. And the unconference allows me to arrive on day one and scribble on a post-it and get a whole group of people together to discuss the thing that I'm most interested in. This is my third year in a row and it's been very useful and productive. So I uh, say thank you for that and also encourage others to feel free to put your post-it up. It's a very uh, welcoming environment. And it also means that when somebody is scheduled at the same time of you, as you and you are both interested in the same topic, the unconference is entirely flexible and you can combine those together as um, Tony and I did, as we were both interested in each other's topics. So the topic I proposed was low surface brightness light. So this is um, very faint light that's generally either in the form of very faint galaxies extended um, or light around galaxy halos or in the specific case that I'm interested in, very uh, faint light that extends across the whole of galaxy clusters, that's intra-cluster light. LSST will be amazing for this very uh, low surface brightness light because of the depth and because of the wide field. But to get to that light, we need to keep talking to each other and to DM about our requirements because they're a little different to the average, um, average requirement. So we had about 17 um, active participants at the session and around five watchers kind of hanging out to see what we were talking about. Um, we each introduced our science interest to kind of see what the room is interested in. And I didn't mention there, we actually had a couple of people who are interested in faint clouds around asteroids, which as a galaxy's person is super cool science. Um, and we had, uh, from that we had three impromptu presentations, so people kind of just got up in the moment and gave us some really quick lightning talks about the work that they've been doing on their low surface brightness science. So we had Alex Delica Wagner, um, talk about his student, Quang Wei's um, efforts to use the LSST stack on DES um, data to look at, uh, to find ultra diffuse galaxies and um, finding successful de uh, detection and photometric measurements with the LSST stack. But deblending is really a limiting factor in finding these kind of galaxies. We also had a presentation from Lee Kelvin um, showing some of the effects, the, the contaminating effects that you get with general data reduction for low surface brightness light. You see CCD edges, sky over subtraction due to bright sources, diffraction spikes, saturation, halos, hideous things. Um, and he also showed how using different background estimators can really make a difference um, in the depth, the surface brightness that you can reach by up to even a magnitude in uh, magnitudes per square arc second. So that was exciting. We also had a talk from Brian Miller, but um, unfortunately, because my email ate his slide, um, I can't show it. But I, uh, to summarize, he showed some beautiful DCAM um, images showing that um, of a particular local shell galaxy and how the local, um, the native pipeline just didn't quite get you down to the lowest surface brightness you wanted, but there was a very neat package that could. So kind of potentially looking at some of the features in that package and how we might use those. Okay, thank you. Thursday speakers, please start to make your way up. So we had uh, an unconference on verific science verification uh, and validation. Uh, so this was in two parts. So in the, in the first part we had uh, a good informal discussion uh, about example science validation ideas that were suggested by, uh, by various uh, science collaborations. Um, in particular, I thought it was really helpful uh, to have the discussion on the solar system object linkage. And we uh, discussed some external reference data sets that would be useful for that. Uh, we also talked about the challenge of difference imaging in the galactic plane. Um, in the second half of the, dis of, of, uh, of the session, uh, Bryce Kalmbach uh, gave a really, a really uh, nice uh, tutorial notebook, uh, did a demo of that. Uh, so this is running on the LSST science platform. It performs an analysis of one of our high level science requirements. It records the result using LSST Verify, publishes the result to Squash, and then displays the time series with Chronograph. 
So it was really amazing to see uh, this implementation of the great tools that DM has been developing and see how it's getting, getting uh, translated to the commissioning project. Hello, my name is Joshua Hoblet. Um, I'm a DevOps engineer with data management. Uh, it's very appropriate that we're talking about deployment at the end of the slide deck and we're running out of time. <clears throat> so this is really a conversation, uh, a continuation of a conversation that started in July when Will organized an event called Puppetthon, which was essentially a two-week sprint to take stock of where we're at with deployment uh, and try and come up with some new ideas to revitalize things and find paths forward. Uh, the result of that event was a document sort of a summary of work and refactoring done during the event and a list of suggestions uh, and changes to the development process going forward. There's been one meeting since then to sort of talk about that and try and build technical consensus, but we really did not have enough time. So this unsession was really an attempt to continue that conversation and build, uh, build consensus, uh, technical consensus within the team of people working on it. I think that we're relatively successful. We have some ideas on a path forward. We're working now in an incredibly limited amount of time with limited resources. Um, so we're really gonna need to pull together and lean on lots of people across the project for help. Thank you. And integration is coming. We weren't sharing blue jeans earlier. I'm sorry for the visual people. So we had a session on LIGO follow-up of LSST. So this is multi-messenger astronomy. And frankly, I'm just uh, terribly excited about this possibility because it's taken decades to for LIGO to get sufficient sensitivity that they are routinely detecting extremely high signal-to-noise events of amazing things like binary black holes and, super, uh, and, and, uh, and other, uh, other things coalescing, emitting gravitational waves that are detected here on Earth. And, and you see on the left there, um, Alan Weinstein presented a, 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 a sort of an update in funny units of uh, the sensitivity of LIGO uh, since uh, 2016 up, up, up into the region sort of mid-survey of LSST. And there's orders of magnitude incre increase in sensitivity over what you probably know from reading uh, the uh, news. And so by mid-survey, uh, LIGO is going to be delivering hundreds of extremely high signal-to-noise ratio events per year. Uh, and so we can pick and choose. And uh, so Raffaele Margutti uh, gave us an overview of the astrophysics that one can learn from this and uh, uh, began to talk at the end of her talk, and I show this slide here, um, about strategy. So you'd sort of like to know about the astrophysics of these things, and so you want to eventually be doing population studies there's blue uh, components to the emission, which tend to be short. I think, personally, we should go to extremely short times with LSST. Uh, and long, longer, uh, red, uh, longer uh, term red emissions. Uh, there are black hole neutron star mergers uh, that can be seen with their electromagnetic counterpart. There are black hole black hole mergers. Now, do they emit light? Maybe we should just look. That would be really incredible. Uh, maybe the universe is full of these things. Uh, and then the thing that interests many of us most is things that can't be described easily. So new things uh, that are, dis are dis uh, described by this method. So um, there's an optimal strategy, and we talked about that uh, a little bit. Uh, the problem occurs, uh, there's, a, there's a problem uh, that occurs if you want to follow up one of the LIGO uh, areas on the sky. Suppose they say, okay, 90% 90 90 probability in some area you paint that rapidly with LSST, and you have to paint it to a certain depth in all your filters in order, in order to understand it. Uh, but in the time that it takes you to do that, 
there are new transients that are occurring in that same area, and there's a runaway that occurs. And so you can't go arbitrarily faint or arbitrarily wide, but uh, by mid-survey, LIGO should be routinely delivering 90% uh, trustworthy areas of less than 20 degrees, uh, 10, 20 square degrees, and we should be able to go to 24th or 25th magnitude. So that's, uh, that's really good because the total joint efficiency of this whole enterprise uh, is only uh, five percent or so, or a few percent, and so you want to have big samples. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I find this really amazing. Hi, morning. Uh, during our presentation yesterday, we provide important information about our team's work at the summit site, based on our safety plan, and we were able to show the tools that the safety team is using on the summit site and also on the logistic transportation to ensure the safety of people, process, and equipment. And we also explain our philosophy, uh, which is uh, safety is a value associated with everything we do. So from here now, safety is a? Safety is a? Safety is a value. Okay, again, safety is a? Very good, thank you. Okay, so uh, Chuck and I, after our plenary, had two sessions on AI, more discussion about AIV and commissioning. We spent some time looking at the planning and logistics, and we had a lot of good discussion with the, mostly the camera team to understand traffic jams. Uh, and we use for that a tool developed by Bill Shaning that will help us understand where we need to, uh, to watch out for uh, conflicts. We also spent uh, quite a bit of time actually uh, looking at the establishment of the performance baseline for the environment. So what does that mean? Well, we have to understand where the telescope is gonna uh, be and what, uh, what other environmental um, contribution will go into having a best image quality. So we, went, we had a good presentation on earthquakes from Franco Coglioni, and then we followed that discussion with uh, the bullets that I, I, I put in there, it's like monitoring vibration, temperature, understand uh, electrical uh, input, um, and other things. So that was actually a very good uh, discussion. And then in the afternoon, the second session, we uh, focused on the testing during this AIV and commissioning uh, phase and starting with ComCam on the car that we mentioned in the plenary, uh, including refrigeration pathfinder, software integration, then ComCam on the telescope, um, and then finally the LSSC cam on the telescope. Okay, so um, we held a session on science validation and commissioning. Um, this was a session that was co-chaired by Chuck Claver, Keith Bechtel, and myself. What we wanted to do in this session was to explore, um, explore ways and potential pathways for the, the community to help the project and get involved in the commissioning efforts of the project, in particular the science verification validation activities. We looked at um, four overall sort of ways which the community might get involved, um, how the community could give input to prepare for commissioning. So for example, in terms of defining fields to observe, fields that might overlap with precursor survey data they have that they could use for scientific validation. Um, how the analysis, um, access to and the analysis of, of the commissioning data itself. Um, the concept of running what we're calling data crunch sprints, whereby we would uh, invite members of the community to come uh, to sprints uh, organized sprints by the project to uh, work together with the project around uh, validation of the uh, LSST data products and services. And then also we looked at mechanisms for collecting feedback. How can we, how can we gather this feedback? How can we build a community that is um, self-sustaining in terms of, of supporting itself and so the community can answer questions from the community together with the project? Um, this session was extremely well attended, which was, which was really good to see, and it was really good to see that there was a large interest from the community in wanting to be involved in these science validation activities. And this chart here um, was taken from uh, Bob Blum and Phil Marshall's session on 
Tuesday around uh, data previews. This was what they presented in terms of uh, one possible scenario for data previews. And you can see in purple and red, I've added in where we might possibly look to run data crunch sprints in parallel with or, or following or synchronized with uh, early access to data previews and uh, following uh, data preview releases during commissioning. Um, and I think I can say that we, the project, took a, a lot of um, uh, took a lot of action items from this. We got a lot of excellent feedback from the community. Uh, we've listened to what you said. We're going to do a, an analysis of this, gather it together, and, and come forward with a more concrete plan as to how we can engage the, the community in scientific validation of LSST data. Thank you. Uh, okay, so in uh, 2017, DM undertook to replace uh, in entirety uh, all of the middleware software systems, starting from uh, a ground up reexamination of requirements. And uh, after a lot of uh, heroic effort by lots of folks across institutions, uh, across DM, um, we're looking at uh, landing this, uh, this big arc uh, pretty soon. So this session was uh, sort of a review of recent accomplishments, what we've been up to lately, and an update of the roadmap for the, uh, for the development effort. Uh, we had to overcome a few challenges in this session, uh, some broken glasses that have since been repaired, and uh, I had to physically separate Nate Lust from his laptop um, to run the session, during which time he visibly withered. But uh, uh, we got through it. Um, the TLDR message is at, uh, at the bottom of this slide. Um, our orig uh, original target was December of 2019. It's now looking like January of 2020. And um, I'm reporting also on uh, the hack session, which had a lot of activity related to the Gen 3 middleware this week. So the items on this slide were all things that happened here at PCW this week. Um, including, uh, you know, pushing forward requirements for making sure that the middleware can uh, work with uh, calibration products pipeline. Um, uh, we pushed forward deck cam camera support a great deal in the session, um, looked a little bit at authentication, and we had uh, engagement from folks who hadn't um, seen the new middleware yet. So we're just at the point where uh, we need to let this thing get out of the lab and the usual suspects of DM people who have been poking at it and uh, work towards broader adoption uh, uh, in other parts of DM and uh, in science users. Okay, so we had a Galaxy Science Collaboration meeting um, yesterday, so it was fairly well attended. Uh, so we had some short talks to start with. So Harry Ferguson talked about um, using machine learning uh, to find um, semi-resolved dwarfs in LSST data. So these kinds of techniques will be useful because um, uh, detecting these things is, is, is hard, so we want to have infrastructure in place uh, to be able to do so before the survey starts. Uh, Gareth Martin talked about unsupervised machine learning techniques, so these are gonna be important because of the sheer volume of the data. Uh, so his talk was on doing morphological classification uh, using unsupervised machine learning. Uh, Ryan Jackson talked about high-resolution simulations, right? So simulations which have a cosmological volume, uh, but have the mass and spatial resolution to essentially resolve uh, dwarf galaxies, which are going to be uh, abundant in LSST data. Uh, Eric Gawaiza talked about extracting photoses from uh, emission line galaxies. Uh, Tom Sedgwick start, talked about uh, extracting luminosity functions using supernovae, right? So if you have a supernova, you know that there, sh well, there should be a galaxy around the supernova, even if the default pipeline hasn't picked that galaxy up. So you can go back to the supernovae and uh, uh, sort of work out where the galaxies should have been, extract those galaxies, and then construct a luminosity function. Um, and one of the interesting things he showed was that if you do this, then the discrepancy uh, between theory and observation at the low mass end of the mass function seems to disappear, right? So that's your satellite problem, so it seems to mitigate the satellite problem, or maybe the problem doesn't exist. Um, and then uh, Brandon Kelly talked about intracluster light, so Sarah Bruff's already talked about uh, the, the, why the ICL is useful, so Brandon uh, talked about characterizing I uh, the ICL and tracking it back through, uh, through time. And then Dan Tarani talked about uh, galaxy modeling, so better techniques of, uh, of modeling the galaxy's uh, light profile, uh, which has implications on uh, getting photometry and things like that. And then uh, in, the, in the last bit of the, of the meeting, uh, which was led by Lee Kelvin, we had a discussion about um, commissioning fields, right? So we would, we would like to have uh, the commissioning data which would allow us to test these pipelines that we're developing um, 
Uh, so this is all uh, uh, is TBD further. Uh, so we're going to discuss these more in our Galaxies Telecon. Uh, so if you're interested in any of these talks, these are on the Galaxies uh, uh, meeting webpage. So please have a look. Thanks. Friday speaker, please. There is only one. Okay, so for the uh, STARS Milky Way and Local Volume Meeting, uh, John Gizes uh, proposed, um, chaired and, and moderated the discussion uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, mainly this was a, a, a moderated panel uh, discussion to make progress on the various issues that John had brought up uh, in, in his report to the, to the plenary on, on, on Wednesday. Um, largely the discussion focused on the following topics. Um, We've had some encouraging interactions with the project on crowded field photometry, which, are, which for Milky Way science, of course, is very important. Uh, so we discussed how that would, how, how we could develop this and how we could just to interact better with the project on this. And then much of the rest of the meeting was, was uh, around establishing these new task forces uh, following the successful approach that other collaborations have followed. Uh, and so we identified the following. Uh, uh, one task force for cadence simulations and metrics, obviously that's vital for the science. Um, a task force about responding to the project on crowded fields, when we hear from them on that. Um, a task force on commissioning and observations and, and even procures the science for this. Uh, a task force on um, astrometry, particularly uh, differential chromatic re refraction, which is the leading term for all the astrometric uh, difficulties we anticipate. Uh, water calibration, including the, the wideband filter. Uh, and uh, find a new one for us, which is uh, sprints and data challenges to really prepare for when main data starts to flow. Um, we had a discussion uh, also about the kind of sort of the, the parameters of what in-kind contributions might mean to us as a collaboration, and what might be uh, valuable to Stars Milky and, lo and local volume. So uh, I'd recommend uh, watching community to uh, see how this develops. And uh, if you have any interest in contributing to Stars Milking and Local Volume, uh, please get in touch. Thanks. Good morning. My name is Rachel Street, and I'm co chair of the Transients and Variable Stars Science Collaboration with uh, Federica Bianco. And our session uh, just a few minutes ago was uh, to summarize the work that uh, our members have been doing in order to prepare for LSST, starting with a summary of our roadmap uh, for this purpose by Melissa Graham, which was a very thoughtful analysis of uh, the work we've done so far to summarize the science cases and what we still need to do in order to actually achieve them, followed by a summary of the work done by our task forces by Marcus Rabos, um, st a summary of the work done in our 2018 task forces, which cover a number of topics, um, but also what we're looking forward to, to doing uh, this year. I gave a summary of the task force for broker requirements, um, which in the process identified a need to really understand uh, just how fast people need the brokers to propagate information about alerts. And we have a current ongoing survey so if you have a really good science case for why you need alert information in under two minutes, you really need to tell me about it using that link now. Thank you. <laughs> One more. <laughs> Federica Bianco uh, gave a very interesting summary on the work that the TBS people are doing on the survey cadence and the white paper proposals, and in particular the uh, work we're doing to develop metrics to help in a analyze those. So I want to thank all of the speakers and everybody who participated. We're going to move on to what we call the special sessions section, which took place. Um, in that, there were three. There was the DM hack, which lasted all week. Is that right? Yep. All week. There was the difference imaging analysis parallel workshop that took place. And there was the undergraduate researchers program. And we're going to hear about all three. Okay, so we, as you know, the DM team is kind of distributed across a bunch of institutions. So we took the opportunity, as we do most years, for, of this meeting to get people who normally work on opposite sides of the country to get together to solve some of the outstanding problems in DM software development. So you already heard from Fritz. Uh, a lot of people spent time working on the new middleware that he's already described. But we had people cooperating and collaborating 
on all sorts of different types of software development, which I have put a representative sample of there. I'm not going to attempt to go through them all, but I think it was a really productive session at which a lot of work got done and a lot of people got to work kind of face to face with colleagues that they don't see for the rest of the year. All right, good afternoon. My name is still Michael Woodvesey, if you remember me from Tuesday. Uh, we had, to be immodest, uh, I think really a great uh, DIA parallel workshop where we got great representation from the project and from the community talking about the basics of image subtraction. So the first lecture was, uh, first session was really had some great lectures talking about that. I put links to the slides because I don't know about URL shorteners, um, but you can go and click on things and that will get you the slides and the live notes that we took uh, for that. So we talked about how well difference imaging is doing now and what our ideas are for the future. In the second session, we heard about very successful stuff presented by uh, Naoki Yasuda about using basically the LSST pipelines and even an earlier version to find 400 supernova with HSC all the way out to a redshift of 1.5, uh, which is really impressive. Uh, we heard about how uh, difference, differential chromatic refraction is a problem for LSST, but with a solution. The solar system science presents really great, cool things that can be arbitrarily computationally expensive, um, but some really interesting ideas. Uh, we heard about light echoes. We've seen them, we know them. You can see them here in the, in the lower right. How do you find such things? And in general, there's this theme of how do you find extended sources in the DIA images? Those are there, those will be interesting. LSST is hitting low surface brightness limits that really allow us to see that in ways we haven't really before. Um, and we heard about strong lenses, and a the theme of both strong lenses and actually sort of the little AGN was a balance between looking at things in DIA and looking at things in uh, just the direct images. If your source is always there, you're sort of looking at both of those ways. Then we had a session with lots of good discussion, kicked off uh, by Melissa Graham giving a discussion of what should we do in alerts in year one or in the first season. I actually find it more useful to think about. Let's say you had no templates, what should you do? What should you do if you have four images? How to build that? And what science can you realistically think about doing? So I've just captured a few thoughts here, but people really had some great things in the notes. And I'll be writing up a summary of this workshop and really trying to pull some of those themes out. And in the last, we had a great discussion about the DA object and associated data project products. There are uh, columns and the DIA object for periodic and aperiodic statistics that have nominal things in there. But this is a great opportunity for the community to suggest what would be useful to find your thing. Not what would be perfect for 20 different things. What would be sufficient to identify it's at least one of those 20 things and go really figure that out. And some of the science collaborations came together and talked about their needs and what they think about they want specifically uh, in the data products, whether that's in light curves or associated metadata or some things like, what's the surface brightness at that point in the galaxy? The supernova brought up, that's not a data product that's calculated, but it's a relatively reasonable thing to ask for. But I'd just like to summarize that I think it's really succeeded in engaging the community in a project. I think there's some interesting ideas the project got. I think this document that I'm hoping to write up will provide both usefulness for the project and the community, and there'll be one round of answers about stuff. I'd like to say a special thanks to the participants, the note takers, and particularly Melissa, who if you know Melissa, did a lot to organize this before and during, and it's one of the most prepared people I've ever met. <laughs> this is how prepared she was for this workshop. So I can't exactly compete with that, but if you know me, you know that I spend my time doing other things. So I made Melissa a difference image hat. <laughs> so thanks, Melissa. Great. So for the... Uh, Second year in a row, we had the LSSTC program for undergraduate researchers. And just starting in the middle of the slide, this is a, um, for undergraduates who have been working on uh, summer research related to LSST. Uh, we had student-focused sessions on Monday morning, including some EPO um, exercises. 
Uh, they had a tour of the Mirror Lab. There were career advising breakfasts and dinners with uh, people at different career stages. And this is supported by the LSST Corporation. It costs about $1,200 per student for two days and three nights. And last year we uh, did formal feedback. It was extremely positive. Every student said absolutely they would recommend this for any other student. Um, we'll do something similar again. Uh, on the left-hand side, um, I have a chart of the, instit the home institution of the students, of the 19 students who attended last year and the 24 students who attended this year. And in green are the ones who attend public uni uh, universities or colleges or community colleges. And I'm putting this up here because a number of people noted that there were very few students from public universities in today's, in uh, this year's cohort. Um, I want to point out actually that for the 2018 sample uh, there, or the, the cohort, uh, six of the uh, students from public universities shown in green uh, came through the program at Stanford and Slack. Um, so they weren't Stanford students. Uh, this year we had nine from Stanford and Slack, and um, only one happened to be from a public university, but five of them were from uh, programs, sponsored by programs that um, uh, target uh, students who will bring more diversity to STEM fields or from under-resourced backgrounds. Uh, so sometimes you don't see the diversity in there. But because people noted that there were a lot of privates on this list, I wanted to just tell you how we select the students. So on the top right, um, we request uh, an expression of interest in the late fall from the advisors. Um, and then in June, we request the final number and names from the advisors um, of the students. And all proposals were accepted for 2018 or 2019. So if you want to change the uh, uh, composition of the universities that are um, reflected there, we need the advisors to nominate their students to come. And um, so please apply. A number of people, we all receive way too much email. And almost everybody who says, I didn't see this, I tell them what email to look for, and sure enough, it's there in their email, uh, and it's very clear. Uh, but if you'd like to make sure that you uh, get our attention next year, go ahead and contact me or Lyndon now. And we're going to put together a list so that uh, we can directly send you the solicitation, and please um, nominate your students, assuming we have funding so that we can run the program again next year. Okay. And that completes the report outs for all of the breakouts that took place. So let's give a round of applause to all of the speakers. <laughs> we are overrunning a bit. I'm going to just quickly flick through a few of the other important part of the meeting, which are the social events and activities that took place. So we had the reception. Here's a few photos of that evening. Board games, a few of you played over a few nights. There was a public talk, which was very successfully attended last night. And some people that decided not to come to the talk. <laughs> and I'll turn over to Jeff to talk about soccer. Sorry, I wasn't ready. I wasn't sure you were going to stop for me. <laughs> uh, so for the 14th consecutive year, We've only had nine PCWs, but actually this goes back to our R&D uh, period when we had uh, all hands meetings. So we started in 2005. Uh, this is uh, an event that um, is typically enjoyed by about 20 of our people. We have really good diversity. We, we have uh, excellent female players playing. Um, and um, I think it really reflects um, both the spirit and the diversity of LSST. So I want to uh, recognize the people who played. I also want to recognize the facility, the Hilton, for giving us uh, uh, water and, uh, and a nice field to play on. And uh, I just want to hope that uh, we keep this going for the future and um, uh, it uh, is a, a nice event for people here. So thanks very much. Thank you. And I just wanted to remind those of you project members who have received an email, although you may not have realized you received an email from me, it's for the Communications and Culture Survey for 2019. We'd like to hear how we're doing as a project and across in our communication as well. And there's a Spanish version as well for all of our Chilean colleagues. Uh, the deadline is the 30th of August, so please do make sure you get that into us so that we can make improvements. Victor. All right, thanks. 
So while we've been here doing all of that great work, and thanks for the quick closeouts there, um, there has also been a tremendous amount of other work going on, which I'm actually very happy about, uh, including work on the site with some dome activity. There's actually a crew working really hard right now on the summit, getting the, tele the M1, M3 uh, reintegrated, and they were successful in getting the surrogate uh, mass on the, on the cell. Uh, they were also able to translate that all the way into the lift, get the lift all the way up to the dome, test out many of these things with 66 tons of, of, of cargo. And we were also able to support some uh, refrigeration su uh, system uh, for the camera uh, being installed in the, in the building. And then I don't have photos, but I do know that the crew at Slack has also been really busy in the, in the uh, clean room, continuing to work with rafts um, and getting those things installed into the cryostat. So again, thanks to the rest of the team that couldn't be with us this week. So um, quick announcements. Rampal just mentioned one survey about communications. Um, we also need, we, we really do need, I will emphasize your feedback on the, the, this week, um, how these things work. You've heard Rampal mention a few times about feedback from last year. We do try to incorporate that. We try to uh, design the week and all the activities uh, around the feedback that we get. So you gotta provide us that uh, for us to do better. And uh, just a note about lunch today, it's not going to be in the f lobby. I guess it's going to be in Presidio 3 and 4. It is a box lunch, so make sure you take it with you because we usually end up with a bunch of extra because people have, have left a little bit early or forget to grab it. So please make that, uh, make that special trip. Um, and then a reminder, this afternoon I think there was the opportunity to make reservations for rooms to extend the week even longer and have some extra meetings. Just also a reminder that there was not going to be a lot of extra help uh, while you're in those meetings. And then let's go through one last round of applause for the local organizing committee. <laughs> if, if you hadn't noticed, it takes an awful lot of people, an awful lot of time uh, in an extended week to make this happen. Uh, in particular, um, there's people like Ian and David and the rest of the, IV, the AV crew. Um, IT gets involved. Rampal has been tremendous in sort of herding the whole thing along, making sure announcements are made. And so to them, I want to extend a particular appreciation. Um, and that also goes to just the, the organizing committee. And Rampal has been working this for months. Uh, to make sure that we get things going. Um, and we had a, a good uh, rest of the committee, but all of it really requires a leader. Um, and then Suzanne did a great job last night, uh, making sure that that went off without a hitch. I don't know if Suzanne's still here, um, but that was uh, well organized and worked out great. Uh, Amanda, uh, the lightning stories was great, was, was awesome. It takes, takes a little bit of hurting there too. Uh, to make that all happen, so that was, that was awesome. I hope um, that the story time domain went well on Wednesday. I didn't hear anything about it, I assume. It was, it was this year was uh, quality, not quantity, but it went well. <laughs> uh, we do like quality, uh, and so that's great. Um, awesome. And then, uh, again, Melissa, thank you very much for really engaging with the whole part. This is a project and community workshop. We really do appreciate getting that scientific the science perspective and the community perspective into this. So again, thanks to all of you for helping out making this successful. This is a plug for, um, we are a uh, dynamic project and we are constantly, almost constantly looking for people. And so this is just another reminder from what I said on Tuesday, uh, or Monday, whatever day it was, um, that we really need our own community to help us look for the rest of the committee, for the rest of the, the team. And, and your participation in the hiring process really does help us get good quality candidates. Um, another plug for next summer, uh, for our European colleagues in particular, um, that there's already this, uh, the LSST at Europe has been scheduled. Um, and so please uh, look for that and register. And then next year, uh, we are already on the books for the 10th to the 14th for the next LSST Project Community Workshop. Uh, we're working out the final details for where it'll be. 
uh, will be here in town. Uh, we just have to sign the contract and then we'll be able to get the uh, no news out to you. So stay tuned for those details. And here you all are in your very nice shirts. Thank you, Emily, and the rest of the comm team for coming up with that shirt this year. Uh, and thank you again for all of you participating in what looked to have been, look, listening to all those breakouts, uh, summaries to have been a really good productive week. That's it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.